time now to take a look at stories making the headlines in Nigerian newspapers. And joining me via Skype is Dotu John, leadership and communication strategist. Good morning, Dotu. Thank you for joining us on this breakfast. It's good to be here. Happy Monday to you. All right, same to you as well. And let's head straight to the papers now, and I begin with the blueprint. COVID-19, despite rising cases, Nigerians say no going back to lockdown. Cases now 4,151, 745 discharged, 128 deaths. We need local and realistic measures. No alternative to stay at home for now, others insist. Another lockdown will be counterproductive. Kiamo. Additional testing centers caused increased number of cases. Level of compliance worries federal governments and legal state government. To the Daily Times now, PDP, BMO, Bika over federal government's handling of COVID-19 pandemic. Buhari's incompetence responsible for spread of virus in Nigeria, PDP. No president setting transparency standard beyond PDP imagination, says BMO. To the News Direct, COVID-19, governors go tough as the WIKE demolishes two hotels. Sonwo Lu shuts hotels, a uh, nightclub in Badagri. Nigerians attack WIKE on social media. To the Daily Trust now, outcry as Nigerians wait for one week to get COVID-19 results. Drivers from Nasarawa Undo infected while ferrying samples. Tales of war from Benue, Kebi, Abuja, Gumbi. Nigeria trails behind Ghana, South Africa, others. Samples, distance, the determining result, time, NCDC source. And to the national economy, CBN assures foreign investors of repatriation despite dwindling oil revenue. Reserves rebound to uh, $34 billion. And the business AM, NLNG, Shell, Indorama, Noto, uh, NGC operations trained and uh, by Wiki's uh, Port Harcourt uh, lockdown. And finally, on the leadership newspaper, experts uh, raise concern as COVID-19 threatens aviation future. Ayata seeks bailout for sector. Ayade urges PMB to lift ban on domestic flights. Uh, 160 Nigerians evacuated from U.S. Uh, arrive in Abuja, Lagos, Kano, Borno, discharged 37 patients. Edo tests uh, 104,186 uh, persons for coronavirus. All right, uh, Dozun, uh, the major stories here talking about uh, COVID-19, government response, and how people are saying no going back uh, to uh, the lockdown. From what you have seen, especially with the rising cases and uh, level of compliance uh, to uh, the measures being put in place by government, should we or should the government put in place another lockdown? Okay, Veronica, I think um, another lockdown at this point in time uh, may be counterproductive. If you had um, studied the situation, you ask yourself some basic questions as to, number one, uh, did the people deliberately um, choose not to abide by the laws, the regulations, or they've not been system put in place to actually guide the people to obey the laws? I'm going to cite an example. If you, if you, uh, if you had an opportunity to visit any of the banks in the last week, you will see how crowded these banks were. And this is going to continue this week. Then you continue to ask yourself whether it's the people or the system. And I've come to the conclusion that rather than blame the people, I'm going to blame the system. This is how it, it operates. If I put my 2,000 naira in the bank and I was locked down for about two, three weeks, you do not expect me after the lockdown to stay in the house because I'm actually fighting for survival. I want to go to the bank to take my 2,000. Majority of the people you see or you saw at the bank last week were not people who went there for heavy transactions. These were, these were people who had 5,000, 2,000, 3,000, 10,000 naira to collect in the bank. But what should have been done in a normal situation? What should have been done if we, if we value the life of an average Nigerian? The bank sends text message to people on their birthday. They send text message 
or as, as, as alert here and there. They cannot use the one-week extension that was given initially to actually plan on how to attend to customer. This is what I was expecting. I was expecting that the bank will have used that period of time because there were skeletal services here and there within the banking system to send text messages to people as to the number of people that will be expected in the banking hall. You could pick it alphabetically. Maybe you can decide to say, I want to attend to people between A and B. And you send text messages to other people that the, bank, that the bank will not be able to attend to them on Monday. If we are going to have people that will flout that, the number will be minimal. So you will have to, you, you have an opportunity to actually attend to people. This is what we have talked about over time, valuing the life of an average Nigerian person. And that's what has played out. So it's very easy for you to say, oh, um, let, let's blame the people for actually flouting the order. But we must look at the system that we have put in place. For example, last week I talked about the BRT situation. If you enter the blue BRT, there were marks on places that people, uh, people were not expected to see. That is clear system management. But in other places, we, we didn't put this thing in, in order. The only thing we put in place was to have announced to the people to use face mask. And I tell you that majority of people, if you look at the percentage of people who actually flouted the face mask order, it is minimum. So I expect this to, to have translated into other areas instead but, of government. But Dato, to do you to, to think that, that uh, Dato, don't, don't you think that people should also be complementing government's effort by being responsible uh, to some extent. For instance, let's uh, take a look at what happened uh, in uh, River State where the governor had to go and demolish some hotels because a majority of the cases uh, were from hotels uh, such as uh, that, where people had to go to hotels to have fun, so to speak. Shouldn't people begin to take responsibility for their health and their life, complementing government e efforts? Government cannot do everything, don't you think? I totally understand the point you are coming from, but I'm going to give you two, two instances here. Mm. The first one is that if you look at the majority of those people who open hotel, for example, you discover that they are party people. They are powerful people. These are people who think that when they flout government order, that nothing will happen. And I need, I need, I, I don't need, I, I don't want us to put the blame on, on the masses for what the political people have done. That's number one. Number two is the area of believability. Have you convinced your people well enough to be able to believe that, number one, their life are at stake? We have not been able to do it. We, we have not since this um, war against COVID-19 started, we have not had a, co a, um, a, a consolidated communication approach to it. We, what we all, all, all often see is that the federal government is saying, oh, this is what we are doing. And some state governors will come out and say, no, that is not the case. So how do you want the people to believe? I, I think over time, our believability is not something that you get within one week. I think over time, over time there has been a serious disconnect between the government and the government. And this is what is playing out now. So the first question you ask yourself is that, in the recent of it, how many people believe? Are we coming out, are, are, are we coming across to the people as a government who is actually doing their bid? That's the question. Majority of those people who actually flattered the order were powerful people. So are you saying and that uh, the, the daily briefing that we get from either uh, the presidential task force and even perhaps let's uh, say the Lagos state government is not enough to connect and pass the message across to people such that they can believe and trust the government to be doing what he says it is doing and also believe that something is really going on? <laughs> uh, you, you know, I, I, I smile because uh, often that's the mistake we have made. We have actually reduced communication to talking. Mm. It's quite unfortunate. If you are saying, you see, we can continue to give directive as against direction. I think every opportunity we have to communicate our idea to people, people believe in what they see people do. You can't say that they should maintain social distance and they see you on television doing another thing. I repeatedly said it that every opportunity we had to communicate these things to the people in action, we have failed. And when you are talking about believability of government, like I said the other time, it's not just about coming. The people must have a sense that, oh, this thing that the government is saying is actually for my own good. And you do not communicate that by words alone. You communicate it by action. But what has been our record over the years? We haven't done so well when it comes to um, creating believability amongst the people. 
And that's the effect of what, what we're having today. It's not just about whether the COVID-19, um, people, um, the governors come on television. Fantastic effort. But you need to understand the kind of people you govern. When you put the percentage of people as we speak now, these are verifiable facts. If you put the percentage of people who have access to television and as against the percentage of people who do not have access to television, you will be surprised. Now, even for those people who can put on their television and put it off, you discover that at the time that the government is talking, perhaps there's no light. When you put at this when you put these numbers together, you discover that we are still far away. And I do not want us to think that the num the increased cases that we are having now is a product of the lockdown. No, it's not the product of the ease of the lockdown. It's a product of more the capacity that government has generated in terms of testing. It is this week now that will determine whether actually the lockdown has um, the ease of the lockdown has actually complicated the number or not. So we, we shouldn't come across to say, oh, um, it's because we eased the lockdown. See, you cannot continue to keep pe the people who do not believe in what you are saying in lockdown. They will think you are punishing them. So what we have learned here now is to be able to bring the people closer to government so that after COVID-19, when government is saying something, the people can easily believe. I said it, you cannot continue to live in opulence and abundance. I'll be telling the people to tighten their bed. They will not understand. That's the problem we have. It's not just about whether they don't know. They know, majority of people that have interacted with, know that COVID-19 is real. They know that this thing can kill. But they are concerned about the sincerity of government. And continuous insincerity of government breeds communal inhumanity of the people. So they will just get to a point that they don't care. They go to a point that they celebrate if somebody dies. So far, the person is in government. These are some of the implications. Mm. And I think that we should begin to learn from here. All right, uh, Dr. Wajong, thank you so much for speaking with us on the newspaper interview this morning. You're it's time to take a look at stories making the headlines in Nigerian newspapers. And joining me via Skype is Dr. John, leadership and communication strategist. Good morning, Dr. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Veronica. Happy Monday. All right. Let's head straight to the papers now. And I begin with the blueprint. COVID-19, despite rising cases, Nigerians say no going back to lockdown. Cases now 4,151. 745 discharged to 120 deaths. Uh, we need local and realistic measures, NYCN. No alternative to stay at home for now, others insist. And then we move to the Daily Times. PDP, BMO, bicker over federal government's handling of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. To the news, uh, direct uh, 19, COVID-19, rather, governors go tough as BK demolishes two hotels. Some will lose shots a hotel, nightclub in Badagri. Nigerians attack BK on social media. Uh, subscribers kick over excess uh, SMS billing by Airtel Network. All right, we'll move to the Daily Trust. Now, outcry as Nigerians wait for one week to get COVID-19 results. Drivers uh, from Nasarawa Undo infected while ferrying samples. Tales of woe from Benue, Kebi, Abuja, Gumbi. Nigeria trails behind Ghana, South Africa orders samples, distance, uh, determine result time, NCDC SOMS. And to the national economy, CBN assures foreign investors of repatriation despite dwindling oil revenue. Reserves rebound to $34 billion. And the business AM now. NLNG, Shell, Indurama, Notori, NGC operations strained by Rike's Port Harcourt lockdown. And finally, on the front page of the leadership newspaper, experts raise concerns as COVID-19 threatens aviation future. IATA seeks bailout for sector. IATA urges pre President Muhammad Buhari to lift ban on domestic flights. 160 Nigerians evacuated from U.S. arrive in Abuja, Lagos, Kanu, Barnu discharge 37 patients. Edo tests 104,186 uh, persons for coronavirus. All right, Dr. Let's uh, take uh, the story on the front page of the leadership newspaper talking about concerns uh, over the threat uh, COVID poses uh, on the future of uh, 
COVID, uh, aviation, rather. Um, aside aviation, uh, COVID-19 has also, you know, dealt a serious blow to almost other sectors of uh, the economy. Talk to us, uh, especially from the window of uh, government's efforts, especially at, uh, you know, helping out with uh, bailouts, especially through the CBN government's approach. How holistic is this at revitalizing the economy? Well, um, <clears throat> what government has done so far is commendable. And um, the plan of government, too, um, is commendable. But again, I do not want us to be too traditional in our plans. Don't let us get used to how we've been doing things and forget about how we're supposed to do things. Right. Now government has earmarked, and I understand that a lot of monies will be going out to uh, big organizations, the, um, especially um, um, the aviation, the aviation industry, production, and a lot of them. But again, the most, uh, we must take account of the percentage of people that will be directly, um, uh, that will be benefiting directly from some of this investment. In other words, let's look at the percentage of people that will benefit from any investment that we make in aviation, for example. As much as we must ensure that the aviation industry uh, does not die in Nigeria, especially um, um, the airlines that are local here, I mean uh, the Nigerian um, airlines, we must also pay attention to the fact that majority of the people that need bail out the most are SMEs. Small and medium scale entrepreneurs need bail out the more. If you look at the development model that is acceptable over the world, especially in a community where the population is very high, it must lay emphasis on development of SMEs. In other words, don't let us forget that because we are building out big organizations, because we have earmarked monies for big organizations, I think there's a need for us to pay more attention to SMEs. Because at the end of the day, when you look at this percentage, you discover that majority of people actually directly or indirectly benefit from the SMEs. So if the Central Bank of Nigeria is concentrating on how to actually bail out some of the big organizations, there must be need for us to also pay attention to the needs of the SME. It could be through the, um, the BOI, which is the Bank of Industry, that has done well in, in, in time past, at least directly I've seen two or three people that are close to me that are not party people. They don't belong to political parties that have benefited from BOI loans, soft loans that can actually aid business. I think we should be a, a light more on SMEs, not just building out big organizations. And the, in, the, the, the effect of that will be more evident than building out uh, big organizations. But what they've done so far is actually commendable. One key thing, according to some cross-section of the uh, society, that's Nigeria, is the fact that uh, data will be very important to driving the effectiveness of any form of uh, effort government through the CBN is making. But you know how we do, or how we perform when we talk about data at this point? How critical is that? It is extremely critical because you cannot actually um, pass your aid across to people who need the aid without data. So it shows that uh, data is actually central. But we are in a very big trouble, and we must not complicate the trouble by talking about the problem. We must continue to talk about the way out. Now, data is not something that you are going to gather overnight, and we have always and almost all the time paid lip service to all our desire to, to, to actually get that, uh, gather data. But this is what we must do as a matter of urgency. Now, we must reach out to the people beyond the, um, asking them to stay in the house. We must reach out to them, calling for people who may need one help or the other to signify. I think that's going to be the simplest way of doing things. Maybe there could be a portal, a, a, a website, or something like a registration center that people can actually go out within the, the words in the community. We are not talking about the local government now because we do not want to gather crowd. We are talking about the basic unit 
the smallest unit of our community. It could be within a political world where we can actually gather those people who need help as urgently as possible. And the help we are talking about is not just a bailout in terms of money that you are going to hand over to people and they will never, they will never pay back. We are giving them, we want to boot, we must um, aim at boosting their businesses. So instead of sitting down and thinking that because we do not have data, we must we, we cannot get across to people, fine, we know that's problematic as we speak. But there must be another way of actually getting across to the people, first asking them what they need and how to meet them. Now, this is not a time for us to begin to set um, 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 unmeetable demand, if there's any word like that, because you understand that if you want to get money from the bank, they ask you to go and bring this, bring this, bring this, bring the death certificate of and, and all that. No, this is not the time where we are. We are in a serious and critical time where we need to express trust in ourselves. There's no doubt that most of the monies we miss, no doubt about that. There are people that will not pay back. Even in banks where people do all manner of registration, majority of them still don't pay back. But we must trust Nigerians at this moment of time, especially the SMEs, those who have verifiable businesses, and we must continue to eject money from the local, the, the local level. We, we add, this is not the time to say, oh, the money that comes to, from the federal government must go directly to the people. No, we must pass through the state, pass through the local government, pass through the councillors in the world so that we identify people who urgently need help. As we speak now, majority of people that are out in Lagos, it's not as if the money they are making daily is even enough to take them home. The crowd you see daily on your way going to the office, how much are they making per day? It shows that solving the problem of Nigeria is not even in millions. If we redirect our, our, our resources in a way that it will benefit the masses, people are, going to, people are going to be happy. There are people today as we speak now, as we speak this morning, that what is going to solve their problem is not even up to 4,000. And the 4,000 that we are talking about is not just a daily 4,000. Give some people 5,000, they are going to hawk pure water on the street. And they will never get hungry again. I mean again. But how do you identify these people? Monies of government keep entering wrong, wrong hand because we are, we are passing through political channel. Until we destroy political channel and see Nigerians as who they are. You don't need to consider party affiliation. There's huge poverty in the country. The other time, a lot of people were, were alarmed when the MBS, the latest report, as to the number of people living in poverty in Nigeria. But I fortunately it. I said even the federal government of Nigeria understand the fact that over 100 million people in Nigeria, as we speak today, live under the poverty line. So what are we saying? We must redirect the way we allocate resources to people so people living in abject poverty can actually have a share of the prosperity of the nation. So focus data. We do not have data. We know that immediately after COVID-19, that must be the, the project of any serious-minded government. And I said it that we will not continue to wait for census. Because if you okay. continue to wait for census, okay. we don't know how long that's going to take. We must drive it from the state and the local All right, level. Uh, Dr. quickly, before we, we let you go, one other aspect is uh, the issue of uh, loss of jobs. A lot of persons are weary of that. And uh, if uh, the government is able to, you know, give certain sectors uh, this uh, bill out, will that absolve uh, people of um, losing their jobs, if I may put it that way? It, it may not. In reality, it may not. Because the model of business we have in Nigeria is a little bit different from the kind of model that even bailout will save the people from the job. This is how it works. Majority of the jobs uh, or organizations in Africa is about the owners and the owners first before the other people. So even if you give out the bill out now, it could be that let's sustain our organization, let's sustain um, the organization first. And in sustaining the organization, it may not just be let's keep the staff. So there's a little bit of disconnect between let's keep the staff and let's sustain the organization. So it may not prevent, even if government begins to do out money to every organization, there will still be huge job loss. At this point in time, there must be an office and I repeat it, there must be an office where people can actually report their job loss cases with evidence. And that's what, that, that's what I mean when I say the other time that it's not just about bailing out big organizations. There are big organizations that we will give money that we still lay off. So how do we how do we how do we manage the entire impact? There must be an office as we speak. We must open an office now where people can actually walk in and register whether they have lost their job. Once you verify it. 
you ask them what exactly they want to do. If right. they have interest okay. in opening anything, then it is then the government will come in to support. So I think that's also very, also very important. Dr. Wanjo, thank you for speaking with us.